So, when I made my first video, a frequent comment I received was that Rachel from the prequel is worse than Chloe. Saying things like Rachel is manipulative, a sociopath, and is the reason why Chloe is the way she is in the original game. And after watching the promotional material leading up to the release of Before the Storm, lead writer Zach Garris reveals the intent for Rachel's character. He acknowledges that while Chloe may have a strong attachment for Rachel, Rachel was not just a hero to Chloe. In fact, she might not be a hero at all. So by the looks of things, Rachel's negative behavior seemed intentional. With this acknowledgement of imperfection, this can lead to one of two things. One, this self-awareness may be able to tell a story about a toxic relationship through the eyes of an unreliable narrator, exploring the tragedy of an unsatisfied one-sided friendship, or two, where this flaw is nothing but a minor inconvenience whose peaks and valleys fail to tell an interesting story about an imperfect relationship. This comment made by Victoria seems to be leaning on the latter, so let's check it out. You know, before the Storm has a difficult task to accomplish. With Chloe as the protagonist, it has to somehow justify Chloe's actions in the original game in an interesting way, showcasing how she fell into a destructive personality that has destined her for tragedy, as opposed to the mishandling of the rebel archetype. While not impossible, to undo my loathing of Chloe is gonna take quality writing. And for those who haven't seen my video on the original Life is Strange, I explained why Chloe's tragedy failed to characterize her in any interesting way, with me titling her as the worst best friend because of her mishandled story. And I further expanded in my Lisa video that no matter how I interpret the story, there's a disconnect with what the story is trying to tell and what is actually happening. But hey, with the prequel now here, it has an opportunity to flesh out Chloe's character. And while I'm of the belief that a story should be able to stand on its own, I'm open-minded enough to give it a shot. And having played this game back-to-back -back with the original Life is Strange on stream, I'll unravel my conclusion as this video progresses. Hopefully, it's a neat addition to the series. So, let's talk about the premise of Before the Storm. We follow Chloe Price, who at the age of 14 experienced two life-changing tragedies. Number one, her best friend Max had to leave her hometown due to her parents moving to a different state. Number two, her father that she loved dearly died unexpectedly from a car crash. To further worsen the situation, these two events happen in the span of three days. Fast forward to two years later, a now lonely and apathetic Chloe is reinvigorated thanks to a newfound friendship with Rachel Amber, the popular girl who saves her from a couple of jerks during a gig. And after their fateful night at the concert, the girls seem now inseparable, as they help each other overcome their own emotional hardships. Their friendship is tested as several tough hurdles stand in their way of their unbreakable bond. Through thick and thin, Chloe cherishes every moment of it, wishing that it could last forever. And we know it doesn't, so we obviously run into the first problem when making a prequel. Tension and drama created from things like death are absent with pre-existing characters. With external conflicts like this being a no-go, this limited toolset forces the story to create drama through internal struggles, which lends itself well to thorough explorations of a character's backstory, which is arguably the only benefit a prequel provides. And to mishandle this can make the overall story feel convoluted and unnecessary. For a good example, look at something like Better Call Saul. Saul Goodman never needed a backstory, but they managed to make a compelling narrative about how Jimmy transformed into everybody's favorite criminal lawyer. And this prequel has the opportunity to do the same thing to Chloe, alongside exploring other things, like Rachel's fidelity, Chloe's reliability as narrator, and how maybe their relationship could have been unhealthy. And it's been stated in promo videos that fans want to find out the details regarding Rachel and Chloe's relationship. And if this highly liked comment from my last video is to be believed, I'd capitalize on this. Here's a basic outline of how I think you could do this. Pause if you want to read it. Now, I'm only showing this because I think this is one way you could salvage Chloe as a character with a prequel, whilst also providing some fan service. Cause let's be honest, some people are kinda thirsty for this stuff. And hey, there could be other ways to approach Chloe's relationship with Rachel in an interesting way, and I hope whatever Deck Nine does achieves this. By the way, the prequel was developed entirely by a different studio, but Deck Nine reassures us that they love Life is Strange, and states that if we love what we're doing, the fans will love what we're doing as well. And with Emmy Award winning Ashley Birch now on the writing staff, it's safe to say it's in good hands. So cool, as long as we're not focusing on surface level stuff and exploring more interesting ideas, the prequel may be a worthy addition to the franchise. 
much like my original video, I'm going through each and every episode, specifically focusing on Chloe's and Rachel's relationship. So, let's get into Before the Storm and see if it explores this duo in an interesting way. Because while people say they hate Rachel, maybe it's because it achieves some sort of narrative intent like Yukari. So, let's see. There's something so relatable about Chloe, and I think that's why so many people love her. It's because we all have something in us or something about her that we either want to be or already have. All right, first scene. Let's see how Chloe gets characterized as soon as the game starts. Okay, by the looks of things, Chloe is already this rebel type of character. So the progression from innocence to rebel is basically non-existent. I suppose people just want to be the Chloe they're familiar with from the get-go, so the focus of the arc will probably center on Chloe and Rachel's relationship and their internal struggles. No Jimmy to Saul arc. Hey, that's fine. So what does she do next? No trespassing? No way. Okay, let's be generous and just say that it's just something an edgy 16-year-old would do, and this is just Chloe's wacky sense of humor. She's broken, and she's not like other girls. The chains of conformity are turning me down! Anyway, the specifics of what happens next don't really matter. After getting to the concert's venue, she accidentally spills someone's drink on themselves because she was pushed back and was knocked right into them. But before these guys could do anything to Chloe, Rachel Amber steps in to distract them long enough to save the day, which then allows the two to enjoy the concert without worry. The night was so good that Chloe states in her diary that it was the best night ever. By the way, we get access to this diary once the concert ends and a new day arrives. She really misses Max. Like, a lot. So here comes the benefit with prequels. They get to fix certain things that might have been overlooked in the original, such as Chloe ragging on Max for not ever contacting her when she herself didn't make an effort. And like I said in my original video, that's been retconned. Of course, what should be noted when a story gets expanded via a prequel, sequel, or what have you, is that if you're gonna take in the good, you can't ignore the bad that comes with it. That's the catch. So hopefully, they don't make Chloe worse somehow. Chloe needs to get to school now, and David is offering a ride. How does he address us? Attention! Alright, uh, he's a casual sexist amongst other things according to Chloe. I can understand why she hates David, but I need more ammunition. Something for me to really hate him. So David is fixing his car and asks Chloe to get a toolbox in the garage. Chloe does so with reluctance and David comments that her knowledge in cars would be helpful if she lost the attitude. But then she says this. You know, you could actually be good at this if you lost the attitude. My attitude is what makes me special, David. All right. Can I talk about flanderization at the moment? Cause I feel like this line here is emblematic of what the writers took away from Chloe as a character. And it's honestly the least interesting and worst aspect about her from the original. With Birch now on the team and being the most familiar with Chloe, the writing staff claimed that she helped try to find Chloe's voice. Like on what she would or wouldn't do or would or wouldn't say. So then what is Chloe as a character communicating if she says this and flips off a no trespassing sign? Cause all I see is a tryhard edgy know-it-all. For your help! Chloe is able to ruin a merch guy's setup, steal a shirt, and $200. Because apparently 20 bucks is too expensive for a band shirt and we gotta show she's a badass somehow. Time to graffiti things. I'd like to think my humor has improved with age. This characterization is far from interesting. 
the car gets fixed, and David wants to discuss something with Chloe before they leave. And here you can initiate the backtalk mechanic because Chloe is sick of David trying to discipline her. First introduced when encountering the bouncer, this mechanic is what replaces the previous game's time travel powers. While Max has her powers, Chloe has a tongue so sharp that it could sway any conversation to her favor. But it's as sharp as a spud because it lacks any sort of bite to hurt anybody's feelings. The main writer claims that Chloe has a wicked wit, which is primarily presented through this minigame. But it's hard to believe anyone would actually be threatened or taken aback with dialogue and delivery like this. I thought we went over this. Isn't it past your bedtime? I don't sleep. It's for the weak. Doesn't the Constitution say no soldiers quartered in civilian homes without consent? Because for the record, I do not consent. Look at my face. Do I look cute? Or do I look like I'm going to kick your ass? Oh, brain freeze. I'm still beating you brain freeze. Imagine if my brain was regular temperature. Anyway, with enough sick comebacks, David shuts up. But what's even more interesting though is that if Chloe doesn't initiate this, David expresses his compassion and understanding. He starts talking about how both of them need to be better people for the sake of Joyce. So, the brand new mechanic that is most in line with Chloe's character provides the least amount of insight with the people she's interacting with. Excuse me? I need more reasons to hate the people Chloe hates, not the other way around. Anyway, we arrive at school and we interact with a bunch of uninteresting characters, so let's skip to Rachel's scene. This is Chloe's first proper gameplay interaction with Rachel, since them dancing was just a cutscene. So here's the thing. Rachel is supposed to be this perfect girl type of character. Everyone loves her, she's super talented, and is a great actor. Going as far as to be described as a chameleon. And the difficulty of that is that you have to make sure that whomever you cast for that role is really good. And if a story involves acting in any capacity, your players are gonna need range to provide the contrast of good and bad, or real and fake. Check out Barry for a great example. But with Rachel Amber, I'm just not sold on her performance. In fact, I think Kylie Brown's voice work is easily one of the, if not the worst performance out of the entire main cast. It lacks charm and sounds unnatural, even when she's supposed to sound like her real self in front of Chloe. So, did you bring flowers from my dressing room? Uh, <laughs> I guess I owe you. I'll hold you to that. To tell the truth, I went to bed last night wishing it never had to end. But then I thought, why? Why does it have to end? Do you want me to cover it up with some makeup? Are you kidding? This is a badge of honor. Respect. Let's get the hell out of here. And as you can hear, Chloe isn't too good either. Despite Ashley Birch being on the writing team, she's not actually Chloe's voice this time around. It's someone else because Birch was participating in the sag after strike, and this replacement just doesn't have the same spunk or attitude that Birch had. So when you put these two together, it's noticeably bad, and there's practically no chemistry. Their relationship is not fun, charming, or endearing. I've seen more sparks fly in a show that does nothing but tease undertones. Anyway, Rachel, inspired by Chloe's label as a delinquent, wants to go rogue by skipping school and catching a train. They get to know one another during this ride. We learn two things from this scene. One, Rachel wants to leave Arcadia Bay because nothing is tying her down. Two, Rachel is good at reading people from a game of two truths and one lie. So the duo arrive at their destination, and Rachel now wants to play a game of improv, cause she's a theater kid. Oh sweet, I was one too. And the game is mocking people through imitation. Loving this guy. What's he thinking right now? I hope bees don't mistake my shorts for begonia. I've been pollinated twice this week already. What do you suppose she's thinking? Nature's Wi-Fi sucks. Maybe there's a squirrel family around here with broadband. If only I can guess their password. We love nuts 69. Dingoes ate our babies 13. Hmm. What's going on with these two? And the Lord saideth, thou shalt make a burnt offering of your firstborn son. 
Who are you talking to, Dad? No one, son. Now, lean into the grill and see if the fire started. Further. <laughs> Further. Wow. That was dark. Is this really the best they could do? I mean, surely, they could have consulted some high school dropkick to teach them a thing or two. Shut up, you man. Fuck off, Jessica. You got saggy teeth. No one's gonna wanna marry you. They eventually spot a couple making out, and while Chloe is still roughing on, Rachel becomes upset. Why? Think of the most basic plotline you can think of. And there you go. Bothered by this sight, Rachel wants to steal some wine from a couple. Chloe is stunned. Not because of the stealing, but because of Rachel's shift in demeanor. Um, can we help you? <sighs> oh my god! Oh, thank god. Please, this girl is in trouble. Go get help. How am I supposed to believe that our protagonists are clever when everyone around them is as thick as a brick? God, it's not even funny if it's supposed to be. So, through one way or another, they manage to take the bottle. And then the duo are seen walking down some train tracks. Then they stumble upon a junkyard. Chloe invites Rachel to check it out, but she notices Rachel's standoffish behavior. Regardless of your choice, Rachel attempts to leave after an argument between the two that goes something like this. Why are you being such a dick? Want to give it a try? No. And Chloe actually takes some accountability here, saying that she doesn't want to ruin their friendship like she does everything, and has the option to profess her love to someone she just met. Regardless, Rachel leaves anyway without explaining why she's in such a mood. Which leads to Chloe bashing the objects that blatantly represent the people in her life. Subtlety doesn't exist in this game. But then Chloe completely breaks down when she sees her dad's car in the junkyard. A dream sequence happens where Chloe is in the car with her late dad, and witnesses Rachel catch on fire, foreboding disaster. More about this later. The characters later on reunite after Rachel calms down, explaining her situation related to her dad. She loves him very much, but seeing him kiss another woman makes her never want to see him again due to her broken trust. Because she's good at reading people, this lie was not a surprise to her because she felt like her dad was lying about something for quite some time. With suspicions confirmed by seeing a text of an unknown number from her dad's phone, this reveals Rachel's true intention to come out here. So Chloe and Rachel relate to one another through their tragedies. They acknowledge that they've been terrible to one another and are grateful for their friendship that has developed in under a day. The conversation continues and Rachel explains that there's nothing keeping her here, at least not anymore. So Rachel leaps at the idea of leaving the town with Chloe. She's serious about this. She later burns the photo of her dad that she keeps with her at all times. She then puts it in the trash, kicks it due to her emotional anguish, and starts a forest fire. Wait, okay, hold on. Why are we introducing an external problem when we can focus on internal emotional conflicts between these two? Why is it her dad of all people? Maybe push the timeline a bit further and make it Jefferson. Now we gotta spend time trying to set up this character that we only know through exposition. A character that is completely unrelated to the first game. But hey, not all hope is lost. Maybe we can explore two teenagers finding out they're not as smart as they think they are and are facing the consequences of their rash decision making and are bonding over their mistakes. Or something like Veronica and JD's friendship in Heathers, where things go a bit too far but the difference is Chloe never knows better. 
better. You know, just give me anything to allow these two to tear each other down then grow and change as people, since this scene isn't even achieving the bare minimum in terms of character development. Because if the story fails to deliver these conflicts that tests their friendship, their relationship is gonna end up feeling hollow and unsatisfying, more than it currently is. Because what we got as a foundation is abysmal. Their conflict is even resolved faster than their friendship started, and it's hard to invest in a relationship this rushed. We do have five episodes, so we have plenty of time to somewhat establish... Oh god. <laughs> it's only three! It's only three episodes! Okay. Okay, this is gonna be rough. All right, we're in a grocery store. All right, here we go. This is great. What do you see up there on the shelves? Gum. Gum is at the register, Barry. So the episode starts with Principal Wells questioning the duo about their absence. Depending on what happens, Rachel can either take the blame or say that Chloe was the one responsible. The former leads to Rachel being kicked out of the school play that's happening tonight, or the latter leads to Chloe's expulsion, wasting her scholarship. Now, what happens next? Regarding these two, nothing really, so let's fast forward to this dream sequence where Chloe is talking to her dad once more. They're talking about fire and how much it parallels Rachel, how it's mesmerizing and how Chloe is so drawn to it that you don't even see the danger. Fire is jealous, Chloe. It wants all the beauty for itself. That's why you need to be careful. Careful of what? of getting burned. Anyway, Rachel drugs Victoria. Why, do you ask? Let us skip to this part. The night of the play, Shakespeare's The Tempest. So depending on what happened in the office, one of two outcomes will occur. If Rachel is still in The Tempest play, Victoria attempts to drug Rachel in order to replace her as a lead. Makes sense, cause we're supposed to hate her, right? But if Rachel is punished and kicked out, Chloe can either use her wicked wit to force the awful Victoria to step down while Rachel assumes the big role. If you do fail in the backtalk sequence, Rachel drugs Victoria anyway. Now, remember the fire metaphor. Was this Ghost Dad's premonition? Maybe, because you'd think someone would question the morality of a person if they were willing to spike someone else's drink like that. Victoria committing this sly crime makes sense narratively because she is supposed to be an awful person, right? Right, and we get it. But Rachel? Really? Now, this wouldn't be an issue if this led into an argument of some sort. You know, like after the play is finished, Chloe approaches Rachel and confronts her about what she just did and was all like, Oh my god, why did you hella do that? Huh? Victoria was being a dick. Then Chloe sings Seventeen from Heathers, even though it was released years later, but this is not the first time a mistake like this appeared. Not the biggest problem. But you know, Chloe is supposed to not question Rachel's actions. So then this would be contrasted to people not blinded by the fire. Highlighted by the fact that no one knows that Rachel spiked the hag. But when Victoria passes out, right? Be it through Rachel or through her bloody own comeuppance. No one bats an eye. Why? Oh why, is there no weight given in this situation? And it's hard, really hard, to take this plot seriously if a girl passes out and the game shrugs it off. But hey, it's okay because she is mean. How thick is Chloe's rose-tinted glasses? Is it as thick as her skull? Cause dear God, what will it take for Chloe to see the immorality of Rachel? Really? The developers claim that the game is emotionally honest, and to be frivolous would be irresponsible. Well, you see, downplaying someone's spiked induced knockout seems irresponsible in a universe where someone else is known to spike people for their own motives. It's screwed up if Nathan drugs somebody for their artistic ambitions, but if Rachel does it, it's fine! How wonderful! Now, you could chalk it up to dramatic irony, but there are no cues to clue us in on this. Nothing from sight or sound. Nothing that was clearly done on purpose. I feel like this line is a thinly veiled defense for any stupid thing Chloe and Rachel get into, without needing to actually construct a scene where Chloe's dramatic irony is then highlighted. Making V's situation, eyes open, illustrate the game's tone-deaf story. 
Why is it treated like a joke? And to put even more salt on the wound, with Ariel gone thanks to the fire, a new one must be found. Victoria! Wait, never mind. Uh, get Chloe instead? What? Didn't we establish that this teacher is up his own pretentious ass? Really? Why won't he just shut down the play as an unforeseen consequence for Rachel's act of rebellion? Why are these characters getting what they want with no consequence? I guess they're trying to be funny, but this guy's no frickin' Gene Cousineau. And while some chick is passed out on the ground, it comically does a match cut to Chloe in costume. How charming. How cute. This is not the time to be comical in your grounded game that desperately wants to be taken seriously with a history of drugging people. Christ! So then, the play starts like nothing happened. Oh, and no matter how badly you do, it still gets well received. Wow! Oh boy! Choice? Consequences? Are they even a thing? So here, what have we learned from these events? Rachel rivals Victoria's exploits. Chloe's blind, like frustratingly so, but so is everyone else too, which is all encompassed in a tone-deaf story. Now, the show must go on. No matter how unaware or stupid it gets, right? Well, here's the thing. It gets worse. So much worse. And you'll see pretty soon. So here. End scene. Alright, yeah! Th thank you. After the school play, Rachel insists on Chloe running away with her, a topic she also discussed some time before the play. There isn't much of a plan, just a let's get out of here type of deal since nothing is bounding her to Arcadia Bay. This scene in particular doesn't explain much besides Rachel feels her dad is just putting on an act, which has gone on for so long that he lost his personality, and Rachel fears that she may undergo the same path. While it's an idea that I like, this motif of truth and lies is pretty heavy-handed. As Chloe brings up the integrity, honesty, and loyalty motto that the Ambers have in their front lawn, it's too on the nose to provoke any intrigue. Anyway, Rachel then asks Chloe if she wants to leave tonight, and she finally agrees after Rachel convinces Chloe that she's dead serious, be it through a promise of a tattoo, giving Chloe her bracelet, or giving a kiss. Do you want to make love, darling? WHAT DID YOU SAY TO ME?! So this then leads the duo to sneak into Rachel's house to pick up some stuff for the trip tonight. But they get interrupted by Rachel's parents, giving Chloe a warm welcome and asking her to join for dinner. While helping prepare for the meal, we can inspect their house and it's evident that Rachel's parents love her very much. So a tense dinner scene is coming up and Mr. Amber talks about how important family is during these difficult times. And with this obvious setup for hypocrisy, either Chloe or Rachel gets mad at Mr. Amber. Who could have seen that coming? Rachel visibly becomes enraged and Chloe can either confront her dad or calm Rachel down. Regardless of the decision, an argument breaks out and Rachel ruins the table. But more importantly, the salad. Oh no! Then it's revealed the person James was kissing is Rachel's biological mother. Cue the one daughter song I know and like, and now we're on to the final episode. Good old mom with cookie crumbs in her hair. I miss her so. In every way that matters, Rose is my wife and your mother. But the woman you saw at the Overlook, her name is Sarah, your birth mother. He whispered it! So we get an explanation on who Sarah is. She was adored by everyone in high school, but for some reason chose James. And during their time together, when everyone pursued education, careers, and families, Sarah was looking for an escape. I wonder who's this trying to parallel? James thought Rachel's birth could make Sarah change, but states again that she was still looking for an escape. But an escape from what, exactly? Are we supposed to feel sorry for this person that we're only learning through shallow exposition? Even her letters don't explain much. If she's this story's MacGuffin, I honestly don't care about the person who's chasing it. James then explains what the duo saw was a goodbye kiss, and expresses his happiness for Sarah getting her life back together. But he denies Sarah ever meeting Rachel because of her self-destructive behavior from heroin and wanting to be a part of Rachel's life after 15 years of neglect and drug abuse is not something that Sarah deserves. But as a deal, 
James sends Sarah money every month with the promise to stay away, and fears Sarah may influence Rachel negatively. And while Rachel and Chloe insist on Sarah being a changed woman, James argues that Sarah choosing money over her kid for 15 years makes him think otherwise. And knowing Rachel isn't concerned about her own safety, it's understandable why James did this from a protective father perspective. Anyway, Rachel is now upset in her room because of the truth. She then talks about the stars and how their beauty blinds us from the lies. The lie in question being that all the stars we're seeing in the sky are already dead. Hey, Rachel, listen. Uh, I get what the metaphor was trying to convey. It's just untrue and stupid. And in this scene, we get to see Rachel's honest feelings of the situation. Upset that everything is a lie, such as her life, her dad, and her mom. It's all lies. Everything. My entire life. My dad. <laughs> My mom. If I can even call her that anymore. Excuse me. Everything? So, the love of your father, be it from overprotectiveness, is a lie. Your stepmother, who loved you without question, is also a lie because she's not blood related? And I can understand that your trust is now broken. But to say the love given by the people who raised you is now null because of a lie that they thought would be in your best interest is baffling. Was she feeling abused, overworked, or sick of trying to live up to unrealistic expectations? Nope, she's upset at her parents because she never met her real mother who chose money over her for 15 years and is willing to throw her selfless family under the bus because of this. Oh, Rachel, you ungrateful little ass. Who needs to think for a second or two when you can spout fake deep philosophy about dead stars? N none of this is real. You're not real. Rachel's family isn't real. Why do you have to be blood related for your love to be real? So Rachel clings on to the idea of wanting to meet Sarah, and Chloe wants to help out. Knowing that Frank has connections with Sarah, Chloe requests Frank to meet up at the junkyard without specifying why. Chloe's now in the junkyard fixing up a pickup, and Rachel arrives sometime after. Frank appears with Damon. Oh, by the way, there's this uninteresting B story revolving around some guy who didn't give Damon his money, and Chloe's now caught up in their shenanigans for whatever reason. This Damon guy asks the duo why they've taken an interest in one of Frank's clients. He then pulls out a knife, asking Rachel how her father is connected to Sarah. Long story short, Rachel gets stabbed and is now in the hospital. Is this the quote-unquote danger from the fire metaphor? Hey James, why not try compromising with your daughter to avoid something like this ever happening again? You're about to be in trouble for this too, so you know, kill two birds with one stone, amigo. Still determined to find Sarah, Rachel sends Chloe to James's office, which is located in their house. Sarah's number is probably there somewhere, and it would make a decent lead. This office segment is just gameplay filler to remind you that this is indeed a game, as Chloe tries to find out where Sarah is. Anyway, there's this guy called Elliot who fawns over Chloe. Throughout the entire game, you have opportunities to interact with him, but Chloe is obviously not interested. But he clings to the hope that one day Chloe may reward him with love. Emphasis on reward. He pays quite a bit of attention to her, noticing all the things that have happened to Chloe ever since she started involving herself with Rachel. This gradually leads him into just straight up following Chloe into a home she broke into from the hospital. She leaves the door open because she's an idiot, which also means that a character can just easily walk into the scene. Guess who it is? That's right, it's Elliot. And the purpose for his presence is to essentially tell Chloe that Rachel is just using her. Okay, this is what I wanted an acknowledgement of Rachel's behavior that Chloe has to confront. It feels clumsy because the acting is bad and lacks subtlety, but I'll take what I can get. But then we find out that he's not saying this for Chloe's safety, but as a way to question why Chloe doesn't love him. He states that he cares more than Rachel, and as such deserves some time and attention from Chloe. What a dork. Can't you see? I just want to help you! Anyway, Chloe just dismisses everything Elliot says, and he either gets arrested for her crime or moves on from loving her. This intervention actually buries the seed of doubt in Chloe's mind, which leads to her confronting Rachel about their relationship. And then Chloe's like, Rachel, I nearly hella got busted! Hmm? What'd you say? Ugh, I think this relationship is too much for me. I just can't handle it anymore. <sighs> but Chloe... Aren't we best friends? 
Oh, yeah! Hella BFFs. Hella BFFs. Okay, unfortunately that doesn't happen, but uh, Chloe is off to doing something else now. Hey look, it's Ghost Dad! In this scene, seeing that Rachel's dad is a turd, Chloe questions whether or not the perfect dad she remembered might not have been perfect at all. This is a nice thought, but why don't you ask your mother if William had any faults instead of jumping into conclusions? Also, this unintentionally foreshadows Rachel's infidelity, why doesn't Chloe question her? With how blatant this game's symbolism is, you'd think they would highlight this aspect of Rachel and- Am I the only one who understands the complexities of this ambitious cinematic masterpiece? This movie isn't stupid! You're stupid! Alright, uh, okay. Forgot to mention this. James essentially hired Damon to kill Sarah. And Chloe is going to Damon's location where he expects James to deliver the money and kill Sarah. But it wasn't James who arrived. It was everyone's favorite, Chloe Price. But she gets knocked out. Frank comes in with the save, Damon is now gone, so Sarah and Chloe get to talk. You know, for a heroin addict who's been addicted for over a decade and only decided to stop a year prior to meeting up with James, Sarah looks and sounds fine. How hasn't long-term use of heroin resulted in Sarah being demonstrably affected? I'd prefer a game where our end goal isn't necessarily the thing we hoped for, but whatever. Excuse me, I was rummaging through your bag the other day for some tic tacs, saw this great big tub of Vaseline, I thought, fuck, these dirty bitches have been doing anal. Sarah makes a point that she doesn't want to see Rachel anymore, and that Chloe can't tell Rachel what James tried to do to her. Not because James shouldn't be punished, but because Rachel needs a loving family, and the truth will ruin their relationship. But ultimately, it's up to Chloe, whether or not she thinks it's right to tell the truth. Hold on, I thought Rachel is really good at reading people. Does she trust Chloe this much already? What about her dad? I mean, surely she'd end up being suspicious of either Chloe or James, right? And by using that big brain of hers, she'd find out the truth anyway. Are they gonna explore any of this, or why not have Chloe question Rachel's relationship and all that sort of stuff? I, I, I... Cue happy montage, credits, and post credits. Wait, that's it? Seriously? No wait, seriously? You know, the benefit of having a MacGuffin character is not needing to flesh them out. Having a character be a mystery that has little or no screen time allows us to project almost anything onto that person. And we only need to care about the person who cares about the MacGuffin. So when an addition in a series starts to uncover who this person is, the game has the difficult task of living up to our expectations, and if done poorly, it may negatively affect an otherwise perfectly fine character that never needed the exploration in the first place. And my expectation for Rachel was that she was mesmerizing and intelligent, so much so that she could manipulate anybody without question, untouchable because of her supposed perfection. Add on the fact that she was secretive about her relationship with Frank and Jefferson, it's safe to assume that she was selfish and led Chloe on for whatever reason, and that Chloe's attachment to Rachel was a form of unhealthy escapism, too unaware of the destructive person she's turned into because of Rachel's manipulation. So destructive, in fact, that it either leads to her death or a ruined town. Making Chloe's story of a broken teenager all the more tragic, as she never had a constructive and healthy relationship since Max. She's a hopeless case that didn't know better, and is now at the point of no return. But what do we get instead? We don't get a compelling immoral character that's got the world wrapped around her finger. We have an uninteresting interpretation of the popular girl archetype. A supposed chameleon that can't even deliver a single line of convincing dialogue. Now pair her with Chloe, then you have a faux deep relationship that's built upon the ungrateful idiocy of two characters who are stuck in a story that's even dumber than themselves. Supposedly smart characters attempting to make profound statements that are quickly debunked when you think about it for even a second. Add on the lack of chemistry and awful performances, their scenes have as much emotional depth as a child smacking two dolls together. Let's be real here. Was the story worth telling? I'm only asking this because this retroactively makes the original so much worse. It doesn't explore the themes it could have explored, and what it does explore is handled very poorly. If you want a decent game that deals with grief and death, accepting the ugly truth or rebellion and escapism, Play the Persona games. Hell, the song Dead Mom explores the grief of a beloved parent and the hatred of the present one from an angsty teenager better in three minutes than this whole prequel did in three episodes. And hateable step-parents? 
Hello, Stanley. I know this must be a very difficult period for you right now, and the adjustment is going to take some time, but I'd like to be your friend. So when you're ready, I want you to feel free to come to me with anything you might need, whether it's advice or just someone to play catch with. You can count on me. This is happening way too fast. Oh, Jesus, when are you going to cut me some slack, huh? I have taken you under my wing and done my best, and all you ever do is whine and moan about it. Now, for the last time, go cut some firewood. But back on topic, because, like, it's nice that we get some insight on how Chloe tried to keep in touch with Max, but this nice small touch is greatly outweighed by the other problems. Like Rachel's father being a district attorney. Was the junkyard hideout so secret that a search party from a government official never bothered checking this area out? I guess Chloe hates the police so much that giving them information is something she's unwilling to do, but what about Frank? He loved Rachel, I'm sure he'd provide an anonymous tip. Also, why didn't the prequel explore anything regarding Frank or Jefferson's relationship with Rachel? Even if Chloe and Rachel weren't intimate, Rachel hiding these relationships from Chloe are big aspects about her that went completely unexplored. Were the writers too scared to make Rachel too consciously malicious or immoral towards Chloe for the sake of the narrative? Was their time together too precious to ruin? Can the only problem in this world be a clear external conflict that we can lay blame on instead of the people in the relationship? Why can't we explore explore internal flaws and the struggles of a young romance instead of some forgettable antagonists. Did anyone even think that Rachel's parents were interesting? And then I'm reminded of this video, where they say it's written by fans. And they weren't lying, because this is just fanfiction level of writing. The whole game is just an excuse to pander towards a demographic that enjoys the game on the shallowest of levels without much exploration on anything else. Why explore the idea of a woman leading another woman on while she cheats on her with two other men when we can get the origin story of Hela? Why explore interesting ideas when you can indulge in a shallow romance in a tone-deaf story? In a universe where a lot of people have been canonically drugged for malicious purposes, why is Rachel drugging Victoria treated like a joke? This action makes the most sense given the fire metaphor, but the fact that no one reacts to Victoria's passing out without much agency highlights how clueless this game is. Given how blatant the symbolism and setups are in this game, the fact this scene doesn't highlight this dramatic irony makes me think the parallel wasn't intentional. And I even haven't touched on other stupid things for the sake of efficiency. This whole game just wants to have its cake and eat it too. We want to play as Chloe, but we want someone like Chloe to be our best friend. Add on the lack of restraint concerning Chloe's development, so any sort of arc is non-existent, while her relationship with Rachel runs as deep as piss on the bathroom floor, then you've got a story that just goes nowhere. What has changed? changed. These characters get what they want, but neither of them go through significant development by the end of the story. And the final two options do nothing to support this. So the first option is one, Rachel hates her father. This doesn't say anything about them that we don't already know in the first episode. Two, Chloe learns that lying is necessary to keep someone happy. A charitable interpretation would be that it parallels Rachel's secrets. But here's the problem. Chloe not revealing the truth to make her best friend happy is vastly different from cheating on your lover with two other guys and keeping it a secret. This is a surface level parallel, not a thematic one. One is done with good intentions, and the other is done with selfishness. And if you actually cared about your significant other, you'd tell them the truth about what's going on. Why provide choices that are thematically unfitting and completely pointless? And this really is the cherry on top. Why provide choices that don't matter at all. Who cares if you mess up the play? People will think Chloe and Rachel did great. Who cares if you don't want to engage in the awful backtalk mechanic? The game is gonna push you in the same direction anyway. And who cares if you make amends with David, which most people wanted to? Chloe is still going to be a dick to him. None of your decisions matter because the original game exists. The most change you can do is whether or not Rachel meets Sarah. Great, how sweet. A selfish git who gets what she wants. Fantastic. Include the awful animation, voice acting, forgettable minor characters, and odd UI choices. The story's lack of redeemable qualities makes this whole game a massive failure as an expansion of a heavily flawed story that never needed a prequel. Now, given the title of this video, who's worse? Chloe or Rachel? I mean, I could list down the number of things each character did and see who's worse, but I feel like doing that would be missing the point. The purpose of this series is to see how badly this best friend character fails in achieving their intended role in the story. A person can do the most awful things, making them the worst, but as long as it serves the story, 
then it's fine. After all, writing a good person doesn't mean it's well written, and vice versa. So let's compare Chloe and Rachel. The first game explores the rekindling of an old friendship that reminds us to cherish the friends we've had in the past, because if left untouched, no matter how hard you try, it may be too late to gain back what you've lost. But the biggest problem I have in this story is how positively it portrays this relationship. With a friendship whose foundation is solely built on what good times they had back then, Chloe's selfish and ungrateful attitude in the present stopped me from feeling anything positive towards her. And while they say that they're such good friends, from my perspective, I'm thinking the opposite. And the plot leaving Chloe's attitude mostly unquestioned, denying the characters to grow from these confrontations, leaves both girls feeling static and unchanged. So when the final decision was presented to me, the choice seemed obvious. The good moments from memory lane, the apologies or last minute change of heart wasn't able to sway me into thinking that this friendship was worth cherishing. And in Before the Storm's case, Rachel is supposed to be the popular girl whose charm blinds us from the danger that she gets us into. But the way the story achieves this is by making everyone around her stupid, even Rachel herself. So having the whole story suffer to make Rachel appear special is a non-achievement. At least in the first game, Max was the only victim to Chloe's nonsense with a believable excuse. But when you isolate Rachel as a character, she's charmless. Making Chloe's friendship, even with her desperation for a connection, feel hollow and forced. She's only mesmerizing because the game tells us she is, which allows the plot to conveniently bend over backwards for the sake of a stupid story. And not only is it stupid, it's tone deaf as well because it features conflict born out of idiocy and shallow exposition, where consequences are minor and none of our protagonists can do no wrong besides be sad or mad at each other for only a second. And while both games featured unsatisfying arcs, contrived conflicts and forced friendships with unlikable characters, Before the Storm amplifies this to an absurd degree that it outshines the original in just about every negative way possible. So with all that said, I think the comments were right. Rachel is worse, and not for the sake of a compelling drama. She's worse because the game doesn't recognize its own stupidity. Oh that. Chloe loves dad, Max has to leave, Chloe is sad that Max and dad are gone. Now leave, and check out these guys' videos. You won't regret it.